Good afternoon, and it is indeed the afternoon, Friday afternoon. Welcome to the road to recovery, the road to freedom with Mark. This is my 28-minute show where I do um, a little bit on mental health. I talk about my experiences with depression and various other um, mental issues and talk about mostly what I've done for myself, the people I've met, the experiences I've had over this quite a long period of time, almost my entire life really, but it's just really a matter of bringing things to the fore, which is what a lot of people are doing now, you know. Initially, when you attempt to do something, you're off, off, often a voice in the wilderness, and um, I've been doing this show for many years now, probably around six years I'd say, and when I first started, this was not a popular issue at all. This was a, a curiosity more than anything else. But as time continued, um, it, it, as I made some progress through my program and it became what it is now, um, the whole issue gained traction and became popular and even fashionable and like anything else um, it's like a parabolic curve where something reaches a crescendo if you like an apex, a top of that wave where um, every man and his dog was jumping on the internet saying I am hope well it's not really true because you weren't hope before, you're only hope now because it's fashionable and tomorrow there'll be something else to leap onto. And unfortunately, those type of bandwagons do any and all issues a disservice. You know, there was a time when we used to sing, thank you very much for your kind donation. Do you remember that? It used to take the country by storm, a 24-hour famine, and it was all the go when kids were involved and everyone was raising money and there was excitement and it got really big, but now nowhere to be seen. And unfortunately, this is the trouble with something becoming fashionable. Fashion is a very fickle thing. Men wore winkle pickers once. We had flares on our bell-bottom trousers so huge you couldn't even see your feet back in the disco days. Things change. Things move on. And unfortunately, when that wave of interest in fashion is over, all that's left is us again. And everyone else has moved on to whatever other shiny bauble might have taken their fancy. It will happen, not if it will. And that's a damn shame because we've come so far. But what will come out of it, regardless of the fact that people have already abandoned the issue and moved away, the good thing about it is that there are the John Kerwins and the Mike Kings and the Stan Walkers of this life who have put so much time and effort into it that it will not fail because they have changed people's way of thinking, people's way of looking at things. They have normalised something that was once stigmatised. You know, to call somebody mad was an insult. Now people have stopped to think a little. Um, especially Mike King, above all others, has been a real campaigner and, you know, he drew a lot of heat um, as he really kicked off the gumboot thing and, and really got it steaming, you know. Poor old Mike has had a lot of critics and, you know, I've watched him develop and evolve over the years and into what he is now. And I must say, he's, he's come a mighty, mighty long way as, as a person, as a human being, you know, he's, we're very, very lucky to have people like him who just keep on slogging regardless of how people try and chop him down. And it's always very, very hard when you're trying to campaign for something that you, you truly not just believe in, something that you live. And Mike King lives this. And I think it's terrible how we have this tall poppy syndrome in New Zealand where anyone who's doing any good 
draws all this kind of negative criticism and people try and chop them down. Now, I'm not saying put them on a pedestal. You know, you don't have to go from one extreme to another. You don't have to worship him and praise him and kiss his feet. You just have to kind of give him a little bit of help and, 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 you know, pull in the same direction. You don't have to do it in a big way. A little donation, if that's your deal, fair enough. Do something like what I do. Um, You know, it's a thankless task, and Arrow Radio works very, very, very hard for the community and struggles along and is not fancy and favoured and popular and has endless pockets of money. This is a shoestring outfit run um, by the donations of charities and yet here it is for its community to work in the service of its community. So you couldn't pick a better reason for a radio and Indeed, why rap for television, let's not forget you. Thank you very much for your efforts in involving us, involving Arrow Radio. The reason that why rap for TV does that, because as the name suggests, it's all about the why rap of the community, what's on, what's going on here. And I think, unfortunately, there's a bit of a, a, a gap between what's going on and us, we don't actually know what's going on, and often by the time I find out about things happening in the wire wrapper, um, <laughs> they've already happened. It's too late for me to go and, and, and enjoy and, and get involved. So, you know, there's the newspapers and this kind of like a little bit of the radio station, but I think we need better lines of communication, more open lines of communication and a change in people's attitudes. There is already enormous community involvement in the wire wrapper. You know, the the good folks of this area are very, very involved in their community, especially the parents with their kids and their schools, and they support a lot of things. But unfortunately, um, and, and I must say, the Hawke's Bay is exactly the same. You know, there's a lot of similarities between our friends in the Hawke's Bay and, and the Wairapa. I feel like it's kind of like my home away from home in many ways when I'm up that way. I feel that I haven't come that far. And the people are, are very, very similar the way they get in behind their communities. They're not massive cities where people kind of walk past each other without any recognition, that, that kind of indifference that people often show. Whereas the smaller the town you get, the more likely you are that someone's going to say good day to you. And that's that's the beauty of small town New Zealand. That's what I love about it. Yes, you know, this is often full of, you know, one-eyed hillbillies. I understand, you know, the, the attitude towards the outsiders and how insular people are in small towns they're not terribly open-minded and they stare a lot but um you know i guess that's our job to encourage people in those small towns who are essentially good people they just need to open their minds a little bit their hearts are open enough and they're good enough people but unfortunately when you live in a small town and you talk to the same people about the same things every day, you tend to get stuck in a rut and the attitude of one becomes the attitude of all and it tends to be a very much us and them type of thing. Um, small towns have never been renowned for being particularly open-minded and yet you get some real characters in small towns and you think, holy guacamole, mate, you know, there's some, some real... Bizarre, almost, almost bizarre characters that are they're out and about in those small towns. But that's what makes them fun and interesting. And a lot of people have walked away from them, abandoned them over the years for the bright lights, big city. Everyone wants to move there, and yet they bitch and moan about the traffic and how difficult it is to get anywhere or do anything. And everyone's pushing and rushing and shoving and queuing. And and then you go to these small towns. And when I say small, even Napier, I mean, Napier is a city, but it's still got that lovely small town feel to it where you feel like you've, you can breathe. You're not being crushed by mountains of people, you know. You can still find a park 
and it's pretty and it's open and you know you can go for pleasant walks and that's what I like but even places like Hastings and you know is a lovely place because it's it's so small in in a way I don't mean it in a disparaging way I mean it in a very good and positive way you feel like you're not going to get too lost there and that's what I like but I also understand that these days our friends from the Carpety Cove tune in on to this program so I wasn't aware of that I apologise for that and uh, I'd just like to welcome you in I spend a lot of time out on the west coast um, out in the Carpety and down towards Bartonui Inlet near Mana and Carpety I, I fish a lot out that way and I've always loved the west coast and my folks used to live in Paraparumu up there uh, when they retired and it was a, a lovely place we used to go up there and visit and walk on the beaches and I guess I've known that region for all oh, crikey 50 years now I've been going up the coast there and it's a place that I really love I find the nice flat wide beach a very very I'm talking around you know around sort of like an eye down to Paraparuma that beautiful stretch of beach and and all that, and there's a lot of wildlife starting to come back now that they've put a bit of swamp here around the around the uh, around the mouth of the rivers there, and it's lovely to wander around there. And I find it a very very peaceful place. And you know, dealing with mental health issues, one of the biggest things um, that I found was it's good to clear your mind. And places like that beach that I was talking about out in the Carpety is a magnificent place to just wander along the beach with, with your trousers rolled up and just walk on the edge of the wet sand there and just get lost in that sweeping, majestic beach that we have and the islands and everything. It is just absolutely beautiful and speaking of beautiful if you do get a chance to get out to the Carpety um, the um, island's been cleaned up a fair bit, there's a lot of native birds there now that they never used to be I think they even have takahe out there now and um, it is a, a gorgeous gorgeous place with an incredible history, an absolutely amazing history um, going back to the early days of, of the colonies and um, Honeheke and Taraparaha and people like that who frequented the area, uh, their stories are incredible. And, you know, I find it very, very soothing to walk down by the beach. And the same is true of Marine Parade um, over the other side. I love walking down there and just... Uh, I amble along, I take my time, I'm in no rush, I'm not trying to get from A to B. It is the journey itself that I revel in, that fresh sea air and just get lost in that moment and forget all my troubles and all my worries and i got plenty so that's what I like to do. I don't have a beach where I live because I live in the countryside. Being a country boy I had to move back to a country town. I've always been a country lad at heart. I was raised in Anaki, so, you know, a beautiful, beautiful green area reminds me a lot of Ireland, you know, and uh, Pangarehu, where I grew up, was miles from anywhere, and it's a really, really gorgeous part of the country. So countryside is where I feel most comfortable in, so I tend to walk down on the river, um, the Mangatanoka is, is my river, but there are others like the Mangafeo, which is an amazing river full of fossils and stuff. It's a, an ancient river where grayling used to be um, prolific back in the day, and I've always imagined, I fantasise one day, that I might discover them again and say to good old Aotearoa, hey, uh, they're not extinct after all. You know, I would love to do something like that. It's just a kid in me, I guess. But the whole point is that when you're dealing with mental health issues, it's good to get out, to get away, and often to be alone, you know. Or if you are with someone, 
to spend that time together silently, simply to be together and walk in silence on a beach is a wonderful experience. Friendship is not always about yakety yak all the time or rush, rush, rush. Sometimes friendship is just being there with each other, for each other, just of the same mind. And that is a very comforting and reassuring thing to have. However, if you don't have someone that you can walk with, consider a pet, consider a dog, because they are very loving and, and loyal creatures. They are a massive commitment, of course, and if you are going to do that, don't leave your dog locked up or chained up. If you're going to commit yourself to a creature, it deserves your care, your love and attention. So at the moment I don't have a dog for that very reason. I'm too busy and it, I couldn't do justice to it. So it's one of those things where if you can afford it, great. And they are expensive too. If they get injured, boy, oh boy, the vet bills are huge. But in saying that, they make for great company. They help you if you're lonely. And if you don't want to go that far and, and, and commit that far, well... You know, there's alternatives. Don't get a cat, please. Get a, get a little birdie if you have to. But, yeah, I, I recommend, you know, a dog. I, I know a few people that are quite lonely and they have a little old dog there and a you know, marvellous companion for them, wonderful friend and um, responsive to your kindness. You know, they encourage kindness and goodness in you. So they bring out the best in you and... I like to think as a friend that's what you concentrate on rather than dwelling on people's mental unwellness or trying to solve their problems, just trying to concentrate on that positive, you know, of, of being there and supportive. That's what it's really all about. It's not necessarily about, you know, broad sweeping change. It's often just about support it's about, you know, reinforcing somebody who's maybe a little fragile, just help them. And it's about help, you know. Help is, is all about lending a hand, okay, and helping people to do things is often a great relief, especially if they have something that, is weighing on their mind because these things kind of tend to eat away at you a bit whereas if you can say to somebody hey is there something you need a hand with and, and give them a hand to achieve something you might notice something that's a bit broken that you can give them a hand fixing and doing those little things like that makes that person who's suffering depression realize that somebody actually cares like really really cares and wants to do something for them not just to say oh that's a shame you know it's just a platitude that doesn't serve anybody you know a little bit of patronizing sympathetic words but actually doing something for somebody a little gift and not necessarily for their birthday but it is very 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 nice to recognize somebody's birthday i have a friend sheree and she diaries people's birthdays she is brilliant at doing things like that and everybody loves sheree because she's thoughtful she's kind and you know she kind of radiates almost it um emits a uh, an aura of positivity about her and people want to share time with her you can see them physically relaxed and more comfortable in her presence because of the type of person she is now there's not a lot of people like that in society but you know if you are one of those people you know one of those people it's kind of like um, Robert Kennedy, and I'm paraphrasing here, one of his great speeches, he talked about uh, the ripples of a pond, how when a stone is thrown into a pond, the, the ripples radiate outwards and, and touch everything around. And this is what I'm talking about, an act of kindness. Words are just words, okay? My words, maybe the good words, words of encouragement, 
but they don't solve anything. All they do is provoke, okay? I am a provocateur. I am here to kick and question and point things out. But I don't solve problems. All I do is give you ideas, empower you that you can solve these problems for yourself and for those you care about, those around you, and those forgotten too. And in that case, a kind word can make a hell of a difference to pick somebody up, you know? That's where a word can be powerful. It's just saying to somebody who feels worthless, you actually do matter, my friend. You do. You are important. And you do matter. And we do care because people who are at the worst end of depression and, and bordering on suicidal or maybe even going down that track, believe that nobody understands and nobody cares. And the world would be better off without them because they just want to stop the pain and... and Maybe there's some degree of revenge that they want to get back at someone for some slight or hurt. So it's that whole spiral of negativity and just breaking somebody out of that with just a little bit of kindness. You know, you remember nasty things that people did to you forever. But you remember kind things too like that. And your whole attitude when you think of that person and they've done something good for you, your your first idea towards them is a positive thought. Oh, that person, you know? So your whole approach, how you talk to somebody, how you act towards me, you think about them, all comes down to that first thought, that first opinion that you make of them, that first thought that comes into your head subconsciously, even before the first real thought is formed. There is this prejudice for want of a word, this preconceived idea of what this person is to you. And the more people that you have positive thoughts towards, the more you know you're on the right track. The more negative you are thinking, the more not only destructive but self-destructive you are likely to be so a lot of it has got to do with your headspace how you are feeling about yourself and just as importantly how you're feeling about other people if you're feeling negative all of the time angry and negative as I often do you've got to break out of that and think positive not necessarily about that but go and find something that you feel positive about Stamps is my deal because I have obsessive compulsive disorder. I love having things neat and orderly. And I find in the cold, wet winter months, this is a good thing for me to concentrate on. And I like to um, have a lot of knowledge about something because it makes me feel empowered. And the more I know, the more I can understand where I am now, where I want to go. I can focus, I can see a clear path because I have plenty of knowledge. When you don't know, you're kind of wandering around and stumbling in the dark and you lack power, right? Because you lack direction, you lack focus, you cannot employ or utilise your resources to their maximum because there is no clear focus or target or direction here. So feeling positive, gaining knowledge, empowering yourself to be able to make decisions and learn and understand that subject and related subjects more easily by spending time becoming better and better and better at something. That's a beautiful challenge to have because what that does, it's a good exercise in progressive steps about how to get somewhere, about showing tenacity, not giving up. This happens a lot when you're suffering from depression and stuff like that, bipolar. You give up very, very easily. You kind of feel collapse. You feel this collapse in you that where, where you just boom, and everything is just gone, just gone. You have no fight left in you. You just collapse, and there's not that willpower, that tenacity. If you look at professional athletes, that's what they concentrate on, and it's not 
It's not the body that they're trying to push that hard. That is of a consequence of pushing the mind hard, of having the discipline and the drive, the tenacity to keep going and never give up, keep running, keep fighting longer than anybody else will. And regardless of how badly you're getting whipped, you fight while it's at the end. This is the ideology of sports, which is quite adversarial. It's, you know, a winner and a loser and that sort of thing. So it's could be considered negative in that regard but it's the practice the discipline the tenacity that is the difference between an amateur who kind of enjoys diddling about and then there is the professional who does everything to the best of their ability at all times drives to improve tries to get to that plateau of excellence and maintain it for as long as they can and when you see a pro do something well you know, even even I can appreciate a golfer hitting off a tee and landing a golf ball within 10 centimetres of, of the pin, and I'm thinking, wow, the hand-eye coordination that's involved there is, is just absolutely amazing that people can train themselves that way. Or when someone's throwing a bucket, you know, in basketball and they get a goal and it's, boom, she's nothing but net. You know, it's, it's wonderful to watch these pros, but you've also got to understand how much they sacrificed. It's not just about the amazing, blinding, raw talent. There's a lot of people got that, but never made it. It is the discipline, the tenacity, the thousands and hundreds of thousands of hours of practice that went in behind that that you never see that made those people brilliant. The support that they had, the coaches, the opportunities, staying injury free, all of those things came together to make that happen and to make them realise their dreams and we all celebrate that momentarily and then forget them rather quickly, all but a few. The point that I make is that if you're mentally unwell, you are more likely to be weak, you are more likely to give up and to fall over, so support is where we need to be. That's the most important thing because it is most difficult to be tenacious, especially if you're bipolar, you know, it's like those magnificent men in their flying machines, you know, you go up to the up duff and then you go down, 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 and boy, do you crash. And when you crash, it's kind of like, how on earth are you going to sustain or maintain anything? Sometimes if you've got bipolar, that's where you need someone just to pick up the load and carry it with you just for a little while until you can get back up. And the trouble is you don't know how long you're going to be spiralled down for. You know, that dip that you've taken can last a long time. It can last a year or two. So, and, and by then most people just give up and walk away. And if you survive through that, well, that's a miracle. But it does happen, and it happened to me, so it's, it's possible. I'm not saying it's probable. I'm saying it's possible to do. Boy, you have to hang on tight for a long time. And even your best of friends... Um, they lose patience, they lose the will to keep going with you on that journey. And sometimes that good friend will vanish and another good friend will appear. And this is the way of life. It's a terrible thing, but it's the way it is. The best thing you can do when you are feeling really down is to look after yourself. Give yourself a little treat. Don't spoil yourself rotten and get giddy and addicted to chocolate and all that kind of nonsense. But do something nice for yourself. And I don't mean some indulgent reward necessarily, but one little thing that makes you feel really good about yourself, something that you've achieved or made or fixed. And fixing something is a really good one. Something's been niggling at you for ages and you get it fixed and you can walk by it like 20 times and go, I fixed that, I fixed that. And, and it, it gives you encouragement to do other small things like that. And even just tidying the house, getting it clean, cleaning the dishes, you know, just getting a nice environment around you can often break you out of a bad slump and you, you can kind of start to feel that traction coming again. You're walking around and finding yourself just dusting everything and just maintaining because once you've got to that point it's much easier to maintain than have no 
no clean dishes in the house and you have to do the entire lot at once. It's just a mountain where you just, you give up and you sit down depressed, surrounded by a shitty mess, and it drags you down. You know, the whole thing is like this dark cloud that sits over you as you sit in your kitchen cold, looking around at all the rubbish and thinking, well, I can't even cook tea. So, you know, getting the decks cleared, having a shower every day, those sort of things make you feel good about yourself and they give you, they reinforce that positive attitude and that is often what I find is people who are really depressed are often very dirty, their house is very dirty, there's cobwebs everywhere and everything is down, depressed, dark, grey, damp, dirty and that feeds upon itself whereas you pull the curtains back let the lights in it's a positive attitude to step forward to say I welcome my light in I welcome the fresh air and I don't want to sit in the darkness anymore because that is leading me nowhere but a downward spiral and as soon as you lift your head up you can feel that sun in your face. You have a nice shave like I did this morning. Feels good. Feels good. Feel good about yourself. And that's a lot of the time where you are much better off solving your problems than somebody else telling you what to do. Now, that's not to say I am an absolute advocate of talking to professionals, trained professionals, not a mate or a mate of a mate who thinks they know something. I'm talking about trained professionals who have seen a lot of different people suffer from a lot of different mental health issues and they can often see triggers that you can't. They can often see certain traits, certain things that you're doing that you don't realise and they can often identify problems much more easily. They give you a perspective that you might not have had before, ideas and experience and that's where it comes down to the experience these people you know psychiatrists psychologists all these kinds of people in the mental health that can help you out they've got a hell of a lot of experience they've seen a lot of different things and they are thorough professionals this is what they do for a living okay they're utterly committed to what they do so it is always good to seek help you should never be ashamed you should never feel like you're a burden because it's only when you seek help that you can get some good ideas and some good support and support is what it's all about doing it all on your own and doing it tough is the hardest way of all you have to be super strong to find all the exits yourself to support yourself and make yourself strong again all alone is very very hard you know a problem shared is halved so it's all about finding the support, looking for it, asking for it, and don't be afraid to ask. Don't allow society stigma of the past hold you back from getting better. Because okay, you need to get better if you, you know yourself. So it's a matter of asking for help from good professionals who will steer you in the right direction. And you'd be amazed what a difference that makes. Well, I've already rocked on far too far. They're probably going to cut a big chunk of this out. So be it. So I didn't look at the clock this time. Anyway, I hope that's food for thought. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to Michael and Veronica, Arrow Radio, Wairapa TV and, and all the sponsors. Thank you all very much for allowing us to do this. I'll catch you again next week. So take care of each other, eh? Cheers.